morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Paget Fisher, Director of Marketing and Business Development with Davis and Kalthau. I just want to go over a few housekeeping matters with you. Um, phone lines will remain muted throughout the program today for all attendees. If you would like to pose a question, as we encourage you to uh, please do, uh, use the Q&A feature uh, within Zoom. You'll find that located at the bottom of your screen. If you're not seeing it, simply hover your cursor towards the lower um, end of your screen and the toolbar should appear. If you click on Q&A, you may enter your question there. And uh, my colleague, Jim uh, Kelney, will keep an eye on those and pose those to our speakers throughout the program. Uh, we are recording this program and we'll make it available at a later time. Um, certainly all questions posed will remain anonymous uh, unless you choose to uh, reveal uh, yourself in that question. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, my colleague, Bob Burns. Um, Bob, go ahead. Thanks, Paget, and welcome everyone. Uh, appreciate all of the, the help, Paget, of you and your team uh, getting getting us rolling on this. Uh, certainly unexpected uh, way of delivering the 42nd annual public officials program. Uh, we've never had one in 42 years that's like this one, doing it uh, via, via web instead of in person. But we hope everybody is uh, healthy and safe and uh, obviously, uh, this is the, the best means to conduct the program this year in the, in the uh, situation we find ourselves. And I suspect that most of you, uh, those, you know, everybody on this program is either in or works with the, uh, the public <laughs> sector. And I think most of us probably thought that Act 10 was going to be the most disruptive change that we were going to see in the course of uh, our careers anyway. But obviously the the uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus crisis has, has uh, way trumped that and it's become a major, uh, you know, the major consideration and be the bulk of our program today, but not all, not the only thing on our program today. Um, we're, uh, we, we've got a, a good panel uh, set up for you. We are uh, going to hear from uh, Mike Van Summeren uh, uh, from our corporate and real estate practice group. And uh, he's going to talk about some uh, economic development issues. Jim Calney is going to talk on open meetings and public records uh, issues, uh, particularly related to the, you know, the virtual meetings and COVID uh, uh, ramifications. And Abby uh, Bussler and Tony Steffick from our uh, public sector practice groups are going to be uh, discussing some of the more specific uh, issues that have come up in, in the municipal and school district settings with, uh, again, related to COVID-19. Um, those of you, for those of you who haven't attended our, any of our prior programs, you know that the traditional format was always a, a cocktail hour with, uh, with a dinner and then, uh, and then the program to follow. Uh, obviously, uh, the cocktails and dinner are not uh, part of the program today, but since our live presentation is being done over the noon hour, we thought that we'd at least send each of you a, a chicken sandwich. And uh, that's, uh, that, that's, that's, it's a, looks a little underdone perhaps, but uh, hopefully uh, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll enjoy that. So uh, our, our actual uh, program items for today, in addition to the chicken sandwich, are going to be uh, public and private partnerships, uh, and Mike's going to discuss that, as I mentioned. Uh, open meetings, public records, and the, and the current uh, crisis COVID-19 challenges. And we'll add a couple of other more recent developments, as well as our usual Stump the Lawyer panel at the end of the program, uh, as time allows for some general questions and, and other presentations. So, uh, in introducing Mike, Mike does a lot of work with uh, TIF, uh, TIF development and, and all related issues there. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting area. The school district folks may not feel as directly involved with this, but obviously economic development in your communities does have a, a, an eventual impact on the school districts too. So uh, we hope that you'll find this interesting and uh, uh, we'll turn the show over to Mike. Thank you. So, um, you know, our, our 
presentation materials mentioned opportunity zones and the presentation is not really going to cover opportunity zones so i just want to explain what they are and explain why we didn't necessarily cover it in the slides and an opportunity zone is a census tract that says that the government has uh denoted as being qualifying for economic development money and how they plan to do that is they give a special tax benefit that allows for private developers to acquire real estate or operate businesses in that area and if they do that they they get access to other forms of capital by way of private investment um, essentially what it does is allows for a tax deferral and a move movement between asset classes without the typical tax treatment. For instance, if you were to go from stocks into real estate, you would have to sell your stocks, you would pay your capital gains tax on it, and then you could put that into real estate. So you lose some of the value to tax. In opportunity zones, if you invest in a real estate project or invest in a business and you sell stocks to do it, and those businesses or real estate are located in the opportunity zone, that allows you, that allows the investor to one, defer any payment of tax for seven, up to seven years, and then any gain on that investment, <clears throat> excuse me, they are, it, it becomes tax free. So, well, it's good for the private investor and can be good for the municipality. There's really no municipal involvement in that other than to know where your opportunity zones are and to tout that as an advertising mechanism. But it's not necessarily a public-private partnership because the only thing that the municipality can do is say, point to the land and say, this area here is qualifies for a uh, special investment, um, but it's nothing that the municipality can do. What we wanted to focus more on was on TIF, which is something that the municipality can directly control. So, First step is what is TIF? And TIF is tax incremental financing. I'm sure all of you have heard of it um, and have an idea of what it is, but there's a lot of miscommunication and a lot of misunderstanding as to what TIF is. So TIF is a financing option that allows a municipality to fund infrastructure and other improvements through property tax revenue on newly developed property. Um, it was originally adopted in 1975 to eliminate blighted areas in urban neighborhoods. Uh, and the reason for this is redevelopment in urban areas could be cost prohibitive. This is part of the reason that there was so much sprawl because suburban areas had uh, more open land, easier to develop. And urban areas, you were already working in tight spaces. A lot of it was already contaminated um, or was you know, considered blighted, um, which we'll get to a definition to shortly. And so there was just a lot more cost to develop within cities and urban areas. And so TIF was designed to help offset some of that cost. So one thing we want to just clear up is make sure that people understand the difference between TIF and TID. A lot of times it's used uh, interchangeably. TIF is the actual financing method and TID is the district where TIF is available. Uh, so you'll see TID is a tax incremental district. It's the contiguous land identified for development utilizing TIF. Um, this presentation is going, due to time constraints, is going to be focus more on the higher level and not on the nuts and bolts of how to establish a TID, how to, um, all, the pro all the processes to do it. We can go into that at a later time. Um, but this will explain how it works, how it can be beneficial, and also some safeguards that we can put in place to protect both the municipality and the developer uh, to really make that partnership thrive. So next is how does it work? Step one, the municipality determines Oftentimes, the municipality will say, we want to redevelop this area. We want, we want development in this area. So then they decide to create a TID. Alternatively, you'll get a developer that comes in and says, this area is prime for development, but the only way I can make the project work is if I get some money from the municipality. I need to have that capital stack established. Um, the capital stack refer, in real estate refers to the various levels of cash, whether it be cash from the developer, which is usually equity, cash from a lender, which is debt, and then in between can be different levels of debt and different rights that can be used. Um, so 
the two the two methods are either the developer comes to the municipality or the municipality sets up a TID and then puts out an RFP request for proposal requesting that developers come in and do this pro do a project in this area. Um, when you're setting up a TID, you establish the base value, which is the current assessed value from all the taxing authorities. And the next slide will cover this. We can go to the next slide. So you'll see you set your TID base value which shows your county, school, technical college, municipality, and your other taxing authorities. That's your base value. And then what you do, what the next step is to establish what you believe the increment will be. And the increment is the increase in value of the property from the base value after it's been redeveloped. So if you have a base value of a million dollars in assessed value, and you think that when it's all said and done and the TID is completely developed and you can do this on a project for project basis, that the new value is going to be $3 million, your increment is $2 million. And so what happens is any property taxes assessed against that par those parcels of land after they've been developed, the increase in property taxes above the base value goes to paying off the either the debt that the municipality incurred or to pay back the developer uh, if it's a pay-go TIF, which we'll get into on the, on the next slide. So there's generally two types of TIF. Upfront TIF, this is where the municipality actually gives a direct payment to the developer to use in the project. Usually this is used to pay for infrastructure, whether it's uh, roads, water, utilities, uh, can be cleanup. Um, and the, in order to get this money, the municipality will sell, will issue bonds and take the proceeds of that bond sale, give that to the developer to be used for certain things. And the, the municipality essentially acts as a lender. Um, in this case, if you're doing an upfront TIF, there are limitations on how much you, the municipality can uh, obligate itself to pay out. And it also is when you will use your additional revenue, the increment generated to, or the taxes generated from the increment to repay that, those bonds. The more common, at least currently, is the developer funded TIF or the PAYGO TIF. This is essentially a property tax rebate. So what happens is the municipality agrees to pay the, prop, the developer a portion of their paid property taxes back. So for instance, again, using our million, $3 million, if the increased property taxes are $100,000, then what the municipality can say is some portion of that additional $100,000, it could be anywhere from 70 to 95% goes back to the developer. And what that allows the developer to do then is to discount how much they're gonna have to pay in increased property taxes and use that money on the front end, you know, in, it increases their revenue essentially. So they're able to get more debt or get more equity from their uh, investors. So moving on the tax incremental financing, there's five main reasons to use it uh, or um, allowable purposes for it. Number one is blight elimination. Number two is environmental remediation. Three, industrial development, four is conservation, and five is a mixed use. So depend, depending on what the developer wants to do and whether it fits in with the municipality's plans, that's when you determine which of these is most conducive for TIF, whether TIF is appropriate. Um, just so we're all on the same page, the definition of blight is any area, including a slum area, in which a majority of structures are residential or which there is a predominance of buildings or improvements, which by reason of dilapidation, deterioration, age or obsolescence, poses a significant health to the general public, essentially. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of annoyed if you see it, the municipality has to determine that an area is blighted, but once, that's, once that determination is made, then TIF can be available for blight elimination. The other major area that we're seeing is environmental remediation. Um, in fact, one of the projects that I most recently worked on 
we were on the seller side and the buyer and municipality were working together to clean up an old foundry in northeastern Wisconsin. And they were the municipality was using a combination of environmental remediation, TIF, and the uh, statutory shield that is a, that is available to municipalities for environmental concerns. So the municipality actually acquired the land, turned around and sold it to a private developer, and created a, a TIF a TID, and made TIF financing available for the developer to do the environmental remediation that was necessary because of all the foundry activities that had gone on in this location for almost 100 years. So the requirements of TIF, generally there is a but for test, but for this financing, the project wouldn't get done. Um, it's a very, it's becoming a very low standard. There is talk in the, in Madison that they've been trying to bolster this and try and make this a more stringent test because there's this concern that TIF is being overused. Um, I can tell you from my experience in both the public and private sector, TIF is probably one of the best tools that municipalities have, especially with the PAYGO TIF, because in the PAYGO side, they don't have to worry about, municipalities don't have to worry about uh, getting overextended, so to speak. Um, because they're on, it's only a rebate of additional collected property taxes. It's not an abatement of property tax and it's not money out of the pocket of the municipality. And that's usually where the disconnect comes because a lot of people think of TIF as a cash handout to a private developer up front and the developer hasn't performed at that point. Um, just to finish off the slide, uh, TIF can be used for infrastructure and public improvements, sidewalks, roads. Um, as well as demolition, soil cleanup, water, and other similar construction costs. Uh, things that, you know, if you have a site that's on the outskirts of the municipality and you're trying to develop that, maybe an industrial park, this is a good use for TIF because it's costs that really are public in nature, but it's a, there's a primary, primarily it's a private beneficiary of them. Um, so moving on, how is this an opportunity for public and private partnership? Uh, TIF can be used to incentivize development in certain areas, you know, depending on what the municipality's master plan is, they can use, they can establish TID districts and then put out in the marketplace that there's TIF fu funds available. Um, you can also use TIF to allocate risk appropriately in redevelopment of heavy manufacturing or similar environmentally unfriendly business operations. This goes back to that project that we did in northeastern Wisconsin. We also had another one that's still potentially in the works. A, the municipality is working with a longtime employer, uh, legacy manufacturer uh, that is right-sizing their operations. And so there's some land that becomes that's becoming available because with the current manufacturing, techniques they don't need as much the manufacturer doesn't need as much space so this municipality is stepping in to redevelop and repurpose some of that land and because of the environmental issues the the municipality can step in use its liability shield and also put some TIF funds out there to allow a private developer to come in and put that property back to productive use on the tax rolls um, as I mentioned before, the PAYGO TIF protects the downside of the municipality because the TIF payments are only made out of the increment. So it doesn't allow for a developer, if a developer doesn't perform, they don't get the benefits. Um, there are other protections that we often see with municipalities when we're utilizing TIF. That includes personal guarantees of the increment creation. Um, so if, if the project doesn't create at least a certain amount of increment, then what we end up doing is the developer has to pay that property tax difference that the municipality was expecting to get. Uh, always want to have a development agreement. Um, and in that case, you usually want to have a right of first refusal or some sort of similar repurchase rights or purchase rights to try and if the developer is not performing in a timely manner, you want to be able to take that project and put it out to another party that can perform better. Um, and again, just 
emphasizing that pay go TIF prevents funds from being expended without the increment creation because the funds come directly from the taxes generated from that, that increment. Um, and with that, I don't know if there are any initial questions at this time, um, but with that, that is kind of TIF in a nutshell. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to uh, send them along as Paget had described earlier, and uh, we will uh, we will address them uh, either as we go or or at the end of the program as well. And uh, I'll be monitoring the uh, questions that get submitted as they come in. Uh, you might say, well, why with this current crisis? Why are we uh, why are we starting with uh, with uh, TIF uh, information and that it, it really is, uh, as we put the program together, we felt we ought to start, although there's a lot of debate about when and how things are gonna reopen, uh, at some point they will, and it's important to kind of keep an eye <coughs> on the road as well in terms of what is, uh, is gonna be available and some ideas going forward. And our program here has traditionally been also uh, intended to help newly elected officials that have uh, first gotten into the uh, into the public sector to uh, have some uh, some preparation on issues and so this th we thought would be a good one to to lead off with and uh, and uh, Mike appreciate the presentation very much and stand by for questions uh, later next uh, we're going to uh, turn it over to Jim Kelly Jim is going to focus on the meetings and records issues that have developed in the current environment and uh, a few uh, scenarios that you may want to keep in mind as you grapple with meeting your obligations under those laws, uh, keeping the public informed, but also not putting folks at risk uh, by way of the meetings and, and uh, other things you have to do day to day in the, in the public sector. So Jim, all yours. Thanks, Bob. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure being seen by you. Uh, I guess I would have to say a uh, little different not having a uh, an audience out there and, and that personal interaction. But the fact is, we're starting to get more and more proficient with this type of communication. And uh, obviously, how we conduct meetings now uh, in many circumstances have changed. As Bob pointed out, uh, this uh, seminar is generally directed toward uh, newer elected officials and, and giving them some idea of certain major issues to expect. Uh, certainly open meetings and uh, public records have been something that uh, has always been a topic that we've discussed. But I think it's also a good idea just to kind of get back to the basics, particularly in a situation like this where we're applying some old rules to new situations. So with that, I'm going to get into meeting basics. Uh, what is a meeting? What's a public meeting? And, and the statute defines it at section 1982 sub 2. And, and I've set out the whole body there. I want to point out a few things that I think are important. It's a meeting, it's a meeting of a government uh, body for the purpose of exercising their duties. Uh, if more than half the body is there, if you have a quorum, it's going to be presumed you're getting together for the purpose of doing, performing those duties. Uh, also important, though, is it doesn't include social gatherings or chance meetings. For example, if you have a retirement dinner, you probably don't for one of your uh, department heads. You probably don't have to notice that meeting. It's a social gathering, and it wasn't done for the purpose of uh, avoiding the application of the chapter. The Wisconsin Supreme Court's gone a little further in describing what's a meeting and, and really put together what I always look at as a three-point test. It's the convening of members of the governmental body where two other requirements are uh, fulfilled. One, there's a purpose to engage in that governmental business. Do the duty. Do what the government is delegated the authority to do. And number two, you have the numbers of present to determine the issue. And that becomes kind of important when you think about it. Not necessarily just a quorum of people 
are necessary to determine the course. It can be less than a quorum in situations such as an extraordinary vote where you need a two thirds vote. One third is sufficient to determine the direction. So that's the meeting basics. But moving on to what we're doing now, well, we're in a different world now. Everybody's been saying it and heck, it's the truth. Uh, we're meeting differently. We're supposed to social distance. We're supposed to avoid being together too much because of the possibility of passing on uh, COVID-19. As a result, we've had a number of executive and health department orders, not the least of which is Emergency Order 5, which prohibits the banning together of 10 or more people. Now, that particular rule does not apply to governmental entities doing meeting in their own facilities. So the 10 rule doesn't apply to you. However, Emergency Order 4, which banned the gatherings of 50 or more people, uh, does apply to municipalities. So we have to keep that in mind, particularly larger governments. I noticed a couple counties are attending today. Those larger governments, you've got to be careful with not letting more than 50 people in or you're in violation of the SAH stay at home order and the mass gathering of more than 50 people under emergency order number four. Uh, in any of these meetings, however, let's not forget that the SAH applies. Social distancing requirements are applicable. You have to separate more than six feet. You have to avoid contact. You're going to want to clean surfaces after uh, you have been in those meetings. The open meetings law doesn't require that all meetings are held in public places, however. And the AG has come out and said, well, we realize we're in a little different situation. So we're gonna take a look at how we allow remote meetings to occur. Uh, one way that traditionally it happened, as in the past, you might have a person on vacation or something and he wants to attend a meeting. So we used to allow that attendance by telephone. But to some degree that was frowned on because some people started to abuse it. Check your ordinances. You might find that your ordinances prohibit you from having a quorum based on telephone. Uh, you have, have to have a certain number actually present. That can be a little troublesome. Uh, you should at least look at that. Most I've only run into it in two of the municipalities I deal with, but it's an issue to uh, be concerned with and probably to address if that's the case. Uh, teleconference, though, is something that is available for public entities to meet, and certainly video conferencing. So moving into how you do it, government bodies must ensure that they follow the notice requirements under the open meetings law, that you have to properly notice it. You have to use an agenda or a list, something that gives a public notice of what you're actually going to be discussing or what business you're going to be dealing with when you're doing a duly constituted meeting. You also now, what the AG has said, is you have to inform the public that the meeting is going to be held remotely. And then you have to give them access to that meeting. Very practically, you've got to give them a telephone number, video conference link, passcodes, any of the login information necessary for them to actually be in a position to participate in the meeting. Now that works pretty good for some people, but what about people that don't have access? What about people who don't have computers or telephone internet access? Probably not too many out there, but there are some. And the AG is cognizant of that. And he warns us that, you know, for people without telephone or internet or people who are deaf, uh, appropriate accommodation should be made. Well, now, if you can video conference, I guess you're covering most of that because, for example, deaf people can, can, uh, can read uh, lips. So you can cover some of those issues. However, if people don't have internet access, they simply don't have internet access. So the one alternative that has been used by some municipalities is simply having a central meeting location where the information is actually broadcast directly and people that don't have internet capabilities can go to that location to view it. 
Of course, you're going to have to have all the social distancing issues addressed at that meeting place. Uh, and there is still some danger of transmission and asking people to come to a location like that. So the AG kind of hedged on this a little bit and he said, the type of access that constitutes reasonable access in the present circumstances in which health officials are encouraging social distancing, including avoiding large public gatherings, in order to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 may be different from the type of access required in other circumstances. Couple things. I think it's telling us the AG is gonna be allow us to take a few liberties with that concern of people that don't have internet access. And um, I also think it's very important to note, that's not going to last forever. It's because of these circumstances, because of COVID, there's a little bit of a laxus that we didn't have before. One thing that I think is a very wise uh, directive of the AG is, what you can do in order to make sure that there is public access is to record the meeting and post the meeting on your website as soon as practical after the meeting. That way there's a lot of public information going out there. And obviously that's our goal. Uh, now there are some other kind of uncomfortable issues though when you're talking about remote meetings. First of all, how you do a closed session. Now the technology is out there. Uh, I know Zoom meeting has that capability. I understand one of the Googles, Google Gather, has that type of capability to actually be able to put the public in a waiting room for a period of time and bring them back. Also got to be a little concerned though, you've got things like Zoom hacking going on and some other confidentiality concerns you might have. However, we have to work with what we have. Uh, Put, get the public back online after they've been put in the other room. Well, two things. First of all, making sure that the public isn't in your closed session. That's one thing that I, I caution you to be very cautious about. The first time I did this, uh, thankfully, one of the members of the public called by telephone, got a hold of the clerk and said, you know, I'm listening to this. And that person was not supposed to be in the closed session. It was a member of the public. So some method of checking with members of the public to make sure they're clear or some very solid technology that makes sure they're clear. And the other thing is bringing them back after. Uh, you're gonna go into closed session, estimate the time and tell people you're gonna come back to either announce or take action. Uh, you have to have that capability that's not always available in some of the uh, different types of um, software that's available. Public hearings is one thing that uh, I think has raised a lot of concerns. For example, in a conditional use permit, you're going to have a public hearing. Uh, you're going to be swearing people in. Uh, the law allows for that. In fact, uh, courts can have remote hearings. The law allows for swearing in so long as you're in the presence of the person being sworn in. So you probably can pass that hurdle. But the AG office also warns us that where complex plan drawing charts are needed to display the or the demeanor of a witness is important to be able to observe, meeting by telephone, quote unquote, likely would not be reasonably accessible to the public. So on that basis, there are a lot of municipalities who are taking the position, let's put off public hearings until after uh, the COVID thing is lessened. Other municipalities are kind of doing a mix. What they're doing is they're setting up that central meeting place we talked about before where people in the public can go and they can watch the information and you can have some of those issues displayed. At least it addresses most of the issues that might come up. Remember, of course, if you're gonna do that type of public hearing, the mass gathering and social distance policies are gonna apply. So if you have a situation that's highly contested, a lot of people are likely to show up, more than 50 people, you have yet another problem. You're gonna to have to separate those people. You can't have more than 50, not to mention, you gotta have them six feet apart. So there are some complications with proceeding with public hearings, have to do that cautiously. Okay, so we know how to do meetings, maybe public hearings, uh, but there's other things to remember. 
we're getting more and more proficient with uh, dealing with things electronically, uh, communicating in general electronically. But it's very easy to convene. It's very easy to do that first issue that you have that can constitute a meeting. A telephone conference is very similar to a personal conversation and qualifies as convening. So if you have enough people convening and you're engaged in a governmental purpose, you've got a meeting and you can be in violation of the open meetings law. You've got to be concerned about that. Think about how easy that is in a three person town. Two of the members, email back and forth. Oh, and by the way, it can be done with the email too. Email back and forth about an issue that's pending. You've got sufficient num numbers to make the decision dealing with a public issue and convening because they're communicating back and forth. Got to be careful with that. Even in a five person board, or don't forget your committees. You might have three per person committees in certain uh, villages I know set themselves up that way. So something to keep in mind. There's also the walking quorum issue. I touched on this before. Uh, it's not always a majority that you need to make a decision on a specific issue. And a walking quorum happens when a bunch of people are uh, as separate groups meeting and talking about how they're going to deal with an issue, a specific issue. Uh, again, communicating can, can, if you have sufficient number, and that could be as much as a third, for example, in a two thirds vote, you could be doing this by phone, text, email, talking about what we want to do in the future. And you can develop a walking quorum. Oh, and by the way, those texts that you're sending back and forth, those are public records. Wasn't that a brilliant segue? Okay, public records. We're going to talk about public records now. What's a record? It's any material written, drawn, printed, what we would expect. And then we start talking about electromagnetic or electronically generated or stored information. So, yes, emails, we all, I think, would anticipate are records for purposes of the public records law. But don't forget things like texts are likely records for public records law purposes, can be records for public records law purposes if they fulfill the rest of the test. And don't forget, particularly you new elected officials, your authorities. You're considered an authority under the people that are kept, are keeping the public records. So if you have a personal email account on your, that you keep on your phone and you're sending things back and forth, to constituents or whoever else about public issues that are part of the governmental function that your government fulfills, you could be creating public records. You likely are creating public records. You have to be careful with that type of thing. We'll talk a little bit more about that as I go along. So some practical things I mentioned. Elected officials, you're your own authority. Texts can be public records, as can emails to and from constituents. Exchange, exchanges on blogs. There hasn't been a case on that yet, but let's say that we have two or three members on the same blog of a governmental body discussing issues. I think they're convening. I think they're, I think they're, um, convening on governmental purposes if they're discussing issues. And if there's three of them in a five person board, you got enough to do the business. So be careful with that type of thing. Facebook posts, can that wind up being a public record? Same type of thing might apply there. The form doesn't matter. And this the AG and case law has, has emphasized. It's not the form that matters. It's not if it's an email, if it's messaging, if it's texting. It's the content that counts. If it's for that governmental purpose and if it's transmitted between sufficient people to do something about it, you likely have a record and you may have a meeting. 
So what? What happens if you do that? Um, you're subject to public records law request. Uh, let's say that somebody decides they want to see all the emails you have on a specific issue. And unfortunately, you kept several of them on your private phone. And a request is made for any and all of your records as an authority regarding to this issue. You may be in a position where you need to turn over your phone for examination, particularly in a discovery situation or production of, of a request for production of your phone in, in, uh, if a case were to come about. It's important that when possible, you want to try to keep that public information in a source that's not intermingled with your private information. Um, moving on to practical advice before I close, um, I strongly recommend avoid using your personal accounts for official matters because of that tie I just talked about. Uh, it's easy to do um, because you're used to going to your private phone to communicate with people. Try to avoid it. Um, if contacted electronically by a constituent, try to get it into a public resource. Uh, many different municipalities have, for example, Chromebooks or other or laptops. Keep those types of communications on your Chromebook or your laptop wherever possible. Avoid official discussions on electronic media. It's one thing to make a statement of this is your position. It's another thing to get involved in a discussion of that position. Again, the latter can very rapidly become a meeting. And one thing that I want to emphasize, if you ever receive a public records request, make sure you contact your clerk uh, in most situations or administrator if you have an administrator. Don't try to answer a request on your own. Uh, you can have situations where maybe you don't return uh, disclose all the records. Maybe you disclose records you didn't have to or or maybe shouldn't have. Uh, so those issues, never do that on your own. That's something you don't home cook. Um, last but not least, I want to make a, a general point. Uh, as elected officials, particularly legislative elected officials, you act in concert with the other officials when you're exercising your authority. Independently, your authority isn't isn't significantly greater than that of a normal constituent. Uh, and for that matter, for that reason, for example, you can't simply demand uh, all your personnel records of your staff, for example. That would have to come through uh, a committee acting in concert. That's where your power is. On the other hand, for purposes of public records, you are an authority. So you need to remember to be cautious about your independent action because you, are, you could be creating records as you go forward and you could be asked to turn those records over sometime in the future, uh, a situation that can be uncomfortable and not to your advantage or that of the municipalities. Bob, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Thanks, Cal. Appreciate that. And uh, we did get a question during uh, the, the presentation about whether or not this program, uh, the slides and the presentation will be available. And I believe Paget will cover that at the uh, end of the, of the program in terms of details on uh, how, uh, how to access uh, this information if uh, you'd like to have it uh, at, your, uh, at your place. Um, and just to follow up on, on one of Jim's points, the uh, issue on uh, responding and needing to be, you know, comfortable and have assistance in responding is, is important because depending on the nature of the request, remember when we say that something is a public record, that only answers the first question. The second question then is, is it disclosable? Because of course there are a number of exemptions that exist not only in the statutes, but it, under case law. And so because of implications of other issues or privacy concerns or uh, statutory confidentiality, FERPA, uh, student confidentiality statutes in Wisconsin, all kinds of things could determine that that, that 
piece of paper or that email or that text, yes, is a public record, but might not be disclosable to the public. So that analysis needs to be done. And as, as Jim said in the presentation, it's, you don't wanna do that on your own. Good to get counsel on that because the, the answers can be very different with different factual scenarios. The other point is remember that all requests aren't the same. The difference between a subpoena, between a public records request, between a uh, discovery request in litigation, all have different rules that apply. And so the source of the inquiry and the format and the forum in which it is in is, uh, is gonna be very important in those two and, and different analyses apply to those different uh, to those different types of requests because uh, they're they, they have each one has its own rules of the game if you will so uh, with that again if there's any questions on that feel free to to submit them and then we'll uh, we'll uh, catch them as we go or cover them at the end and uh, I'll be monitoring the questions so next up uh, we're going to have uh, Abby and Tony. Uh, team up on some of the general considerations for the current crisis and some of the issues that we've seen develop and that various clients have uh, brought to uh, our attention and give you hopefully some uh, helpful assistance and on all that. Uh, and maybe though to start off, Abby, if you want to take a minute or two and just uh, touch on the uh, recent uh, uh, statements uh, or position that was a, stated by uh, Secretary DeVos of the po Department of Education with regard to uh, special education uh, that might be helpful to the school district folks in the group. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Bob. Um, happy to be here with everyone. Um, wish it could have been in person, but this is the next best thing. We're still able to update everyone and provide you with the latest information. So as Bob noted, uh, yesterday, the uh, U.S. Department of Education Secretary, Secretary Betsy DeVos um, made her position clear on how she wants to handle any type of waivers or requests for accommodations under the uh, federal regulations of IDEA in terms of um, students with disabilities receiving their free appropriate public education or FAPE within their least restrictive environment or LRE. So right now, as you all are experiencing, we are doing virtual um, virtual school for, for all students. And obviously as Governor Evers has stated, that will continue through the end of the school year. And in, um, in serving students with disabilities, um, obviously students with disabilities are still provided that virtual education and it's been encouraged that um, uh, from uh, Secretary DeVos that educators um, continue being innovative with providing those services as she determined it was not worth um, doing a um, it wasn't worth doing a waiver for um, not being able to provide that student with their free appropriate public education so well, as you guys probably have experienced, um, some virtual services are still appropriate for students with uh, disabilities, and you can still provide space to some. Others um, that, for example, might require um, uh, physical therapy or occupational therapy, you know, four hours a day, well, it's pretty difficult to do that remotely. So um, those students are not able to be receiving their free appropriate public education at this time. and. Um, we do anticipate that that might lead to some compensatory education claims from, you know, parents who um, are seeing that are not seeing their child uh, receive all of their services right now. Um, that could lead to um, due process claims um, when school reopens. So definitely something that we just wanted to get on everyone's radar and know that we are happy to assist with any questions you have. Um, uh, right now or in the future as well as this is you know a constantly changing um, area so with that um, one second I'm going to transition us into um, looking at oops, sorry about that um, looking at the CDC April 8th um, critical infrastructure 
So um, as you guys know, the COVID-19 and the CDC uh, response and the Wisconsin Department of Health Services response has been ever changing and um, definitely has, um, has evolved throughout this. And one of the most um, important brief, uh, relatively recent uh, guidance uh, relates to the CDC critical infrastructure. So this allowed for emergency responders, janitorial staff, and other custodial staff or other workers in you know, that critical infrastructure such as manufacturing, informational technology, transportation, government facilities, as many of you, your municipalities are uh, dealing with, they are continue, those workers were able to continue working um, following any potential exposure to COVID-19, provided that those critical workers remain asymptomatic and any additional precautions um, are implemented to protect them and the community. So uh, potential exposure meant um, being in a household or having close contact within six feet of an individual, um, being confirmed or suspected with COVID-19, and that time frame for having contact with an individual includes that period of time, 48 hours before the individual became symptomatic. Um, it, CDC also set forth protocol to consider after a suspected exposure. So uh, that would include um, providing that pre-screen, you know, measuring for that employee's temperature and assessing their symptoms, you know, being able to ask uh, if uh, those employees are experiencing some type of chest tightness, uh, a cough, uh, respir respiratory symptoms. I believe the CDC is up to nine symptoms now that uh, show that you may have um, COVID-19. It's important though to note too that the employer is responsible for maintaining that record of the temperatures if the employer is taking temperatures regularly and making sure that that remains confidential because that is a health record of that employee if you're taking temperatures every day. Um, if there is a suspected exposure, you know, continually uh, monitoring those employees and making sure that that employee um, is checking to make sure that if they do uh, start to develop symptoms that they are alerting their employer right away and not coming into work. Uh, that also includes, um, you know, wearing a mask when possible, especially, um, you know, some type of cloth mask, not necessarily a mask that would take away from the hospital's um, uh, ability to wear the, uh, those types of masks, but um, a cloth face mask to help um, help protect um, the employees. Obviously practicing that social distancing, maintaining that six feet, and then disinfecting and cleaning those workspaces, um, you know, making sure that you are taking that extra step to be sure that everything is clean and, um, and, and as safe as possible. Uh, the Wisconsin Department of Health has issued guidance as well in determining when it's appropriate for all employees and employers to uh, return to work. Um, before I get into that, it's important to note that um, the Wisconsin Department of Health Services uh, is a little bit different with their approach on essential workers and making sure that people really are taking the time to quarantine a little bit more if they were possibly exposed. So that is where the Wisconsin Department of Health Services is a little bit more strict with that and a little more restrictive versus the CDC guidance. But uh, regardless of that, when they're determining, okay, how do we get employees and employers back to work? Um, they're looking at, you know, the location and the duration of the exposure. You know, is it, is it a type where, you know, there's employees um, all working right next to each other, no possibility of social distancing, you know, this, um, the, the number and types of cases um, that are types of employees who might have been exposed. You know, if, you, if you're an employer and you have multiple um, building locations and, you know, you know that it didn't um, create any exposure at building A, but building B had a case, well, then you would um, be able to limit that exposure at building A because you didn't have any positive cases there. Um, and definitely looking at, you know, the timing of those illnesses, but also um, the potential for the infection to, 
will spread within the business. So it's really a case by case determination when you're trying to consider, you know, when can we return to work and how, how can we safely do that? Because at the end of the day, that, that's the main purpose here is to limit exposure and try and, you know, flatten that curve as all the medical experts have been saying to, to really limit, um, limit that exposure and um, limit the, the chance of um, additional cases. And that brings us to the Badger Bounce Back Plan. Um, we wanted to highlight this plan so that everyone is on the same page and really understands what type of criteria is necessary before everything starts opening up again. And um, it's important to note too that this applies obviously just to Wisconsin and um, this, was, this was supplemental to Governor Evers' stay at home order that is still set to go through um, May 26th. But when we're looking at the Badger Bounce Back Plan, we're looking at Wisconsin's criteria. So uh, the first one, as you guys likely saw, was the downward trajectory of cases within that 14-day period. So it includes COVID-19-like cases reported, but also ILI cases, so in influenza-like cases as well. So in case you know someone didn't end up having COVID-19, but something very similar, some type of other influenza-like case, we have to see that negative trajectory go down. And you know um, we've been able to ramp up our testing, and which is which is great, which is what we need before we can continue to reopen. But with that, we've seen on um, we've seen an increase of positive tests. So we. We need to see that downward trajectory um, for 14 days. And we had it for about two days um, a little bit ago, and we uh, took a little spike. So we're hoping that um, we can continue to move down there. So uh, the Badger Bounce Back Plan has uh, three phases. And once you would hit the end of that phase, we would be um, without any further restrictions. Uh, one of the other main areas that the Badger Bounce Back Plan um, it contains is that testing requirement. And that's saying that anyone who has symptoms can be tested and will be tested. Um, obviously in the past, testing has been a little bit more challenging. And I know that everyone within the state um, has recognized that that is a major issue and has been ramping up the testing. Uh, the goal would be to hit 85,000 tests a week, um, all of those tests being reported to public health and patients, you know, having that, um, having that uh, local health care system um, be able to provide those tests, but also have like mobile testing sites, um, not just having testing at the hospital because, you know, we don't want every single person who has COVID-19 symptoms going into the hospital and increasing that type of spread. And uh, we're also looking at that tracing aspect of that Badger Bounce Back plan. So that's where we have individuals who are investigating that case, um, trying to figure out who was that person in touch with, how could this have spread. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen on the news um, a lot of dialogue regarding tracing um, with respect to the JDS uh, meat plant. That's been a big area where they've been talking about, okay, how can we trace this? Where did these cases come from? So that then we can try to, um, try to get that on that downward uh, trajectory. And um, obviously in showing those individual guidelines, um, trying to get everyone to follow good hygiene, you know, um, the badger bounce black, plan does not require uh, cloth face coverings, but it does strongly recommend that. And I don't know about you guys, but I've definitely um, seen an increase of individuals who are uh, voluntarily wearing different masks and cloth face coverings. It's kind of a way where you can get a little bit creative. Um, all of mine are red, so for my for my roots of being a badger. So um, that's, that's kind of my tidbit with the cloth uh, face covering. But um, looking at those business guidelines as well within the badger bounce back plan, you know, they're encouraged to have those businesses look at 
How can we physically distance individuals when we bring them back into the workforce? You know, is there a way that we can have all of our employees socially distancing? Are we going to implement some type of temperature check? Um, obviously, the temperature check isn't perfect because some individuals may have COVID-19 and not know it and not be subject to a temperature or a fever, but it at least helps with that process. And, you know, definitely increasing their testing, looking at um, a company's sanitation procedures, um, looking at those common areas such as uh, you know, like lunch areas where uh, in, um, where employees would gather, um, and then looking at business travel too. You know, um, is that necessary right now? How how can we limit that and um, those types of considerations? And then, obviously, most importantly, not letting symptomatic people come to work, sending them home, requiring some type of clearance from a medical provider before they're returning and then participating and working hand in hand with that local health department to contract uh, trace any COVID-19 positive cases. Um, the state guidance, you know, if you, if you have COVID-19 or suspect that you have it, that 14 day quarantine, that um, medical return to work and really increasing that testing guidance. Um, the federal guidance has been um, emphasizing that critical infrastructure workers and allowing for those individuals to continue going to work. And I also wanted to mention before I turn it over to, uh, to Tony that recently there have been a few more areas where workers have um, been included in this Badger Bounce Back plan, um, trying to reopen a little bit more business allowing for more curbside pickup and, and curbside drop-off. Um, specifically, uh, they've uh, allowed um, dog groomers to begin um, providing services um, at a limited basis, lawn mowing, uh, repair shops, and even car washes. So they're definitely trying to open things up. And uh, for all of you nature level lovers as well, they've um, reopened any of those uh, temporarily closed um, state park. So that's definitely something to consider if um, a state park is within your municipality, just to have a heads up that they, they will be um, reopened as well. So that's kind of the basics on um, where, where everything stands from a, from a state and federal guidance perspective, because, you know, that's a really important aspect to consider when, when you're looking at when do we return to normal and how do we safely return to normal. And with that, I'll turn that over to Tony. All right. Well, thank you so much, Abby. I appreciate it. And uh, before I get into the uh, substance of my, uh, my portion of the presentation, I think I can speak for Jim and Bob as well. But, uh, but our associate attorneys, including Abby and Mike, have really uh, done a great job on staying up on top of a lot of these laws and these changes and helping us uh, adequately guide uh, and advise our clients. And, and this presentation is no different. Uh, both Abby and Mike were more than willing to hop in and, and help us out. And so I just wanted to make sure that we recognize that right at the start. Uh, turning then into my uh, the substance of my presentation, a lot of this is gonna dovetail with some of the things that Abby said, but uh, uh, a lot of it is kind of, okay, eventually we're gonna get back to work here. And eventually businesses are gonna reopen and we're gonna get back to normal whatever normal is gonna look like uh, moving forward out of this crisis. So uh, the first slide uh, as part of my presentation is about monitoring employees. And, and in, it's always kind of one of those things where uh, you know, there's almost kind of an inherent tendency to say, well, no, I can't ask my employees anything with regard to their health status. That is off limits. Uh, totally. And that's, that's always not true, but that's particularly not true in light of the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, we get a lot of questions about, well, what can I ask my employees, like Abby said? And, and we can say, you know, you can ask your employees if they're experiencing any symptoms of, of COVID-19. If you're noticing symptoms of COVID-19, like an employee who is, who is at work and is coughing or is uh, overly lethargic or, or other things, you can ask them how they're feeling. If they're, you're noticing symptoms, you can ask the employee to go home. Uh, you can ask that once somebody has been sent home, perhaps for either quarantine or 
or an actual COVID-19 diagnosis to have a doctor certify that they are clear and ready to become ready to come back to work. These are all things that you absolutely can do. And these are things that you should keep in mind going forward. One thing though that we do like to emphasize and a lot of the literature out there emphasizes is that temperature in and of itself is not a foolproof plan for uh, whether somebody has COVID-19 or potentially has COVID-19. Uh, somebody could be sick with COVID-19 and, and test out perfectly normal on their temperature. So that's why it, it's very important for your frontline and your uh, and your employees to be not only monitoring temperature, but all sorts of other potential symptoms as well, because somebody with a bad cough uh, could test positive, so to speak, on a temperature test, and uh, you still might be in a position where you have to, uh, where you have to ask for the questions or perhaps send that employee home. Uh, Abby ran through the CDC and the Wisconsin guidelines, and though our best advice on that is follow that. These are, this is the government telling you what you should and can do with regard to uh, monitoring and testing. Why not comply with the letter of the law? One of the things I'm going to talk about at the end of my portion is, you know, potential liabilities that could arise and you put yourself in the best position possible if you simply follow what the government is telling you you should do. Uh, if an employee or a customer or somebody else later challenges what you did. The easiest thing for us as your lawyers or, or anybody else for that matter to argue is, well, we did what the law said we were supposed to do. What more did you expect? So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, my next slide is on confidentiality of medical information. Abby touched on this as well, but if you're taking these tests and you're monitoring temperature and everything, this data that you are collecting is confidential. You have to keep that just as secret as any other health-related information uh, about your employees that you would have. In best practice, your HR departments uh, will tell you best practices to actually have a separate file within an employee's file uh, to, uh, to house any medical-related information. Keep that kind of on a double layer of secrecy. That's where you got to put it uh, with regard to this. Even if it's you're checking everybody's temperature every day, yes, it can be tedious. Yes, there can be a lot of records, but you have to treat that in the proper way. Uh, when I think about the confidentiality of, of COVID-19 related information, there's a lot of talk about, well, you know, what can I tell? What can't I tell? Blah, blah, blah. And I kind of think of it as a can ask, can't tell type policy. You can ask your employees information about them, themselves. However, you can't specifically tell your other employees information about a different employee. So let's say somebody is, somebody is in the line and takes a temperature and it pings at 101 and that employee is sent home. Now, if, there's, if you've got a socially distanced line where employees are waiting to get their temperature taken, and that employee leaves and doesn't come back, okay, somebody's gonna put it together that they tested positive for a temperature. But you can't disclose that. This gets tricky when you have an employee who reports either being in contact with somebody with COVID-19 or test positive for COVID-19 themselves. The question becomes, what can you tell your other employees who might have been in close proximity with this, uh, with this employee who who has been affected directly by COVID-19. Again, you cannot disclose that specific employee's name. However, you can say to your other employees, we've had an employee test positive for COVID-19. We have reason to believe that you, as part of your job duties, may have been in close proximity or contact with this person. We recommend you do X, and whether X is take 14 days to self-quarantine, to get tested, so on and so forth. You can say that. Now, again, your employees, if they put the four puzzle pieces together, are going to figure out who it was, and that's fine. There's nothing you can do about that. But you certainly cannot just say, John Smith has got COVID-19. You need to quarantine. That would be, uh, that would be bad. Uh, and finally, before moving on from this slide, another point is, is that there's no carte blanche reporting requirement for uh, informing either state, local, or federal authorities, uh, health departments, so on and so forth. 
that you've had an employee who tested positive for COVID-19. However, we're all municipal clients here. Let's say, for example, you operate a hospital uh, uh, through your municipality. There are other reporting requirements for healthcare providers when they know of a patient that has tested positive for COVID-19 and that those have to be reported. Odds are, you know, we're a month plus into this. That's all taken care of. But for those of you who are maybe new in your role or overseeing the entire, uh, the entire municipal body, these are things that you should just be aware of. All right, moving on to my next slide. Uh, there, we get a lot of questions about hiring and onboarding employees during this, uh, during this crisis. Now, most businesses out there aren't in an active hiring mode right now and they're laying people off. However, there are other industries where you see that, uh, that hiring is taking place. For example, I see the commercials all the time where the Walmarts and the Festival Foods of the world are looking for additional employees in light of, uh, in light of increased need right now. So if you are in a hiring mode, that's great. Uh, that's great, getting people to work is, is great, but you do have to have some recognition of things that could pop up uh, in light of this crisis. Now, uh, the first couple of bullet points is that employers can screen job applicants after making a conditional offer, uh, post offer medical exams. The easiest analogy to this is, uh, pre-start, post-offer drug testing, right? You can't ask for the drug test before, but you can't ask for it uh, after you've made a conditional offer and you see what happens. So similarly, COVID-19, you can ask a new employee to, uh, to have a medical exam before they start. The key though, is making sure that you do it for every single employee because you don't wanna create uh, potential liability. Perfect example, and we'll talk about this example later as well, but uh, you know, if you ask all of your candidates who appear to be a little bit older to take a test before they start, but you don't ask the candidates that appear to be a little bit younger, you might have the best of intentions, right? It might be, well, I wanna do this because I don't want somebody who might be utter, you know, overly susceptible to be coming into my workplace. Well, good intention does not make an illegal act legal. So uh, you certainly make, need to make sure that everybody is treated uniformly, no matter their age, sex, race, uh, blah, blah, blah. So uh, before moving on, a couple things to remember on this one is that simply because somebody may be of higher risk is not a reason to deny somebody uh, a job offer. Again, if the employee appears to maybe be a little bit older or has some sort of other, you know, outward physical disability that you would you would have uh, you know obviously noticed during the application process you cannot make a decision based on that what you might want to do though when you're onboarding or hiring employees is make sure to ask a question uh, whether the employee can start immediately upon receiving the offer now there's a couple reasons for doing that now one might be if somebody was just in a hot spot and comes back and has to quarantine for two weeks, well, they might not be able to start right away. Uh, where I'm anticipating that also being a problem and where you wanna make sure that you ask if people can start right away is the situation of somebody who maybe has kids, okay? You clearly can't make a hiring decision based on whether somebody has kids or not, but there might be a situation where somebody is, is out of work right now but has kids at home and doesn't have school available and doesn't have daycare available. And so if that person were to start their first day, they may then ask you for the extended family medical leave under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, saying, well, thanks for the job, uh, but I can't start on my first day because I need to stay home and take care of my kids, and I now have the job and you need to pay me two thirds. Now there is a, there is a, a 30 day, uh, qualifying period under that law, but that's easy to, to potentially avoid. So if somebody has the situation of being at home, uh, you, it's important to ask that question about being able to start immediately because then they have to answer yes or no. So those are some things to think about with hiring and onboarding. Uh, reasonable accommodations, uh, I'm not gonna get into a big, uh, 
uh, spiel on the Americans with Disabilities Act or the Wisconsin Fair Employment Act here. Um, but uh, your standard duties to reasonably accommodate various conditions uh, obviously apply during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, COVID-19 in and of itself isn't a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act that you have to accommodate in the same fashion as a, as a different disability. However, one of the things that may come up is that this crisis may exacerbate the conditions of a, a different underlying disability like anxiety, depression, OCD. This change up of the world as we know it uh, may send uh, you know, certain people on a different journey than they're usually on. And if that happens, uh, there may be additional accommodations that you're gonna have to make. Uh, upon uh, discussing it with your employee. Now we're, we're into this a little bit. Uh, odds are most of those situations probably already arose, but it's something that, uh, that you need to uh, keep in mind. Uh, before moving on from that, one of the things about reasonable accommodation that we'll talk about now and can skip ahead later is uh, before COVID-19 happened, I know, you know on our team, we would uh, have a lot of problems where uh, employees would ask for remote working as a reasonable accommodation for their disability. And we would get, you know, the employer would push back pretty heavily on that to say, well, no, you know, our culture insists that we have our employees here or our operations mandate that our employees have to be here to make sure that we get everything done smoothly, properly, so on and so forth. Well, if there's anything we're learning out of this whole COVID-19 experience is that uh, businesses are able to continue and succeed when their entire workforce is working remotely. Davis and Kiltho is a great example. We have all of our attorneys working remotely and we're doing just fine. We're succeeding in light of this. Uh, so down the road, uh, the analysis of whether telework or working remotely is a reasonable accommodation for a disability is gonna get a lot more scrutiny and it's probably gonna be viewed as a much more uh, viable alternative, uh, alternative accommodation. So something for you to keep in mind. All right, so EEOC guidance for return to work. We've talked about that both in the context of my presentation as well as uh, Abby's, but I'd ask you to point to the uh, second bullet or to Note the second bullet point about accommodating employee requests for modified protective gear. Again, before this all happened, we would get uh, some inquiries about, well, this employee wants to wear a mask. This employee wants to uh, have a certain distance away from folks. Uh, the world has changed now about that. And if an employee comes to you right now and says, well, I want this certain accommodation, uh, you'd be well advised to agree to it as long as it's not completely uh, out of bounds, you know, if, if, if one of your departments just physically requires people to be working closely together, you'll probably be allowed to still insist on that. But, uh, but modified protective gear, if needed, absolutely granted if you can. And quite frankly, you're probably in the best position if it's something that's simple uh, and easy to perform to provide it to all of your employees. All right, so when can, should an employer send an employee home? Uh, Abby talked about that uh, and she was dead on about it. If somebody is exhibiting any symptoms of COVID-19 or another flu-like condition, send them home immediately. Um, it's, it's not worth it to, to bargain over it. You're in a much better position to keep yourselves and your employees safe by making that decision right away uh, to send that person home. You can also send the person home and we emphasize may if somebody uh, that you know has been, if the employee's been in close contact with somebody with COVID-19 or just returned from an area with widespread, widespread ongoing transmission. Something to be aware of though, and our team actually talked about this over the last couple of days, is you, you wanna shy away from making generality uh, generalities or assumptions like, well, your, uh, spouse is in the healthcare field. So therefore, you need to go home. Well, that's kind of making a stretch of an assumption. Now, the spouse may have been exposed to it, but the spouse may not have. And so you got to analyze every situation a little bit differently and uniquely and figure out where you need to go from there. 
All right, so the next several slides, and I realize we're running a little bit on time, so I'm gonna just kind of summarize these a little bit. But uh, after this is all over, there are gonna be discrimination type claims made by employees. We don't know exactly what they're gonna look like, but we know that it's gonna happen, right? That's just, anytime there's a crisis, there will always be litigation that comes, that comes out of it. And most of the litigation will probably be based on regular standards that existed before COVID-19, but that the facts of COVID-19 maybe bring certain things to light. So the thing for you to remember over the next several slides on discrimination claims is when you're, re when you're reopening or when you're making hiring or, or layoff decisions now, you gotta make sure that everything is, is done uniformly. And uh, you can't be making any decisions based on any sort of protected class or anything that could even be considered, you know, related to a protected class. Like I talked about before, age uh, is one that's going to pop up. So make sure that all of your decisions are uniform. And before you make any decisions or start bringing employees back, I think it's really important for you to examine your, your process and go through a couple stress tests on them to say, okay, this is how we want to flow back into reopening business. How are we going to do that? And go through the scenarios and see if anything smells bad as you do that. Like, well, boy, you know, as we, as we're looking at uh, bringing people back, it, it just appears that we're bringing the younger workers back first. Well, that would be bad. There would be a claim that would come out of that. Or if, if it looks like it's, well, we want to bring back people who didn't take sick leave under the emergency paid sick leave act well don't do that that would be another uh pothole for you to step in so make sure that you test everything out and that you're comfortable in your decisions beforehand so going forward um okay discrimination claims we've talked about that and going forward again if you could do that um abby telework we've talked about uh again be careful about denying requests for telework you're gonna really want to be able to articulate why telework is not a reasonable accommodation to a certain uh, employee, which very well may be tough going forward. Uh, and so then a couple more slides, uh, workers' compensation for you uh, municipal employers here. Uh, it's important to note that for the Wisconsin uh, legislature has come out with, uh, with uh, laws that say about first responders if a first responder comes down with COVID-19 there's going to be a presumption that the uh, that the employee contracted that while at work which would make that a workers comp compensable injury uh, for those of you who do not employ first responders though uh, in the eyes of work comp COVID-19 is really no different than influenza or any other sort of transmittable uh, disease in that it's incredibly tough to prove that an employee got that disease or that sickness while at work. Um, however, if somebody does get sick and they claim it, you do have to go through uh, your analysis and you do have to create all of the records that you, uh, that you would have to do both under work comp and under OSHA. So if there's some reason to suspect that somebody did get COVID-19 at work, you have to go through the process and make the determination. Earlier, Abby mentioned the, uh, the meatpacking issues that are going on right now. Odds are some of those employees got that exposure at work and it's probably gonna be pretty easy to trace it. Um, and if that can be established, then that would be a workers' comp injury that would be compensable uh, here in Wisconsin. So if you do get a claim, be sure to go through the uh, process and the analysis to determine whether you can prove that uh, or the employee can prove that it came from work. Uh, okay, we talked about that. And then the last slide that I wanna touch on real briefly is unemployment compensation. Uh, I think it's a couple weeks ago now, the uh, Wisconsin legislature passed the changes to the unemployment comp system in that the waiting week period was eliminated. There are additional employees that, or individuals who could get work comp uh, that usually couldn't. For you municipal employers, if you have you know, independent contractors who maybe serve small roles for you uh, or do, or do you know, one-off type of projects, uh, this person, those people could now request uh, unemployment comp uh, under the law now. 
you of course are not a guarantor of those benefits. The state ultimately makes the decision, uh, but keep in mind that those might be additional claims because uh, uh, you, if those claims are made and granted, you may have to you know, re, uh, re up the fund, so to speak, with regard to unemployment comp. But one thing that you need to remember is the extra $600 that the federal government is providing to all employees that are, those are funds that you would not be obligated to, uh, to re, uh, refill the till with regard to unemployment comp that those are totally separate. Last point is what, did, what if an employee requests to be laid off because that employee could maybe make more money on unemployment than, uh, than working for you. It's a case by case analysis, but I know our standard, um, advice point is as well if there is work available and the employee doesn't want to do it uh, making more money on unemployment than doing the work is not a valid reason for them to quit and still get unemployment uh, you can insist that the employee work and if they decide they don't want to because they think they're going to get more money on unemployment you are fully entitled to object to any future unemployment request and indicate that the employee actually voluntarily left employment and that they weren't terminated or laid off by you. So uh, that is my last slide. I appreciate the opportunity to talk today. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Burns as the moderator to tee up um, our last several minutes of Stump the Panel. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony and Abby. Uh, appreciate that uh, good information. and. Uh, we did have a question come in that would be uh, related to Cal, Jim Calney's area. Uh, I'll take a first crack at it and then uh, you can weigh in too, Jim. Uh, the question is, uh, should closed sessions be recorded or have meeting minutes? And um, yeah. personally, I'm not a fan of recording closed sessions. Uh, that, you know, it's not necessarily uh, a right or wrong answer to that, but it, it's a matter of do you want to have that that preserved record? Because obviously, recording of it then becomes a, a public record, uh, and over time, the purpose of the closed session may be eliminated, which would then make that disclosable. Uh, so, generally, uh, my recommendation is usually you just you do have minutes, but they're very succinct. Basically, what the topic you disclosed on your agenda uh, for the closed session, you'd have discussion of that item if it's one of the rare instances where you're able to take action in closed sessions such as to uh, uh, approve a, a settlement offer in some pending litigation or something like that uh, you would just indicate that in in the minutes that that action was taken but uh, beyond that uh, closed sessions minutes are I think the less is more rule applies uh, and I and I would I'm not a fan of recording them Jim yeah, I, I think the an, the answer you gave is complete and right on point. I think it's very sound advice. Uh, that's a record you don't need to create. It's a record that can be troublesome in the future. And uh, simply having a record of actually what was discussed and what you did is adequate and allowed by the law. Uh, another question for uh, Tony or Abby is uh, what, what if you uh, know that one of your employees has been to a, to a mass gathering or has been, uh, you know, out and about with uh, friends uh, at the, uh, at a, you know, uh, cookout in the neighborhood or something like that. Uh, what's, what's the appropriate reaction for the employer in that situation? Well, that's a great question, Bob. That's a tough call. Um, you know, the law says you're not supposed to do that. But as our team has discussed, it's a pretty slippery slope if the employer starts busting uh, the employee for uh, for doing that, because then next time the employee speeds down the highway, you could have the same argument. I think it's just something where you have to have a real frank conversation with your employee about it and say, well, you know, you were in you were in contact with people outside of your household. Uh, was anybody exhibiting any COVID-19, you know, uh, symptoms? Uh, you know, were there, you know, were there kids running around that were jumping into your arms, uh, things like that? And then based on whatever the facts are, you might have a situation where you have to tell that employee, hey, look, 
you know, we need you to, we need you to quarantine. We need you to make sure that you didn't pick, uh, pick anything up, but each situation will have to be analyzed different. And also I think how you handle it depends on the, the classification or level of employee uh, that was partaking in the conduct. You know, if you've got, if you've got a first responder, uh, you know, fire, police, EMT, something like that, that, uh, that, uh, violated the safer at home order and went to one of those gatherings. Now you've got maybe more risk um, where that person is going to be in close contact with others and they might have to sit on the bench for a couple of weeks. Um, but, uh, but beyond just analyzing each situation, I, there's no real hard and fast guidance on that. Okay. Thanks. Um, any last questions before we uh, turn it back to Paget, and she can uh, address the question about uh, getting a hold of the PowerPoint and uh, last. So last last call for questions. I don't see any new ones popping up. So we certainly appreciate everybody's uh, attendance uh, through the wonders of technology today, and uh, we will. Look forward to having a real live in-person uh, get together next year at this time. And, uh, and uh, the, the chicken won't be a rubber chicken. It'll be the real thing. So thanks, thanks again for everything. Uh, Paget. Hi, thanks everyone again. Um, so like I said earlier, we did record the session and it will be available on our website along with the PowerPoint materials uh, this afternoon. And we will push it out to all of you who attended uh, as well for future reference. So stay tuned, have a good afternoon.